The Flintstones, written by Mark Russell, art by Steve Pugh. All right, so The Flintstones by Mark Russell is the mystery book I was teasing for the last several weeks. And uh, this is a really good book, and I wanted to cover it on my channel because it's not something most people would have picked up, and uh, most people don't know how good this book is, so I'm really excited to share with you all the story. So for those of you who don't know, The Flintstones were our TV show in the 1960s. Uh, it was The Simpsons before The Simpsons. It's about uh, Fred, Wilma, their daughter Pebbles, their dog Dino, and their neighbors Barney, Betty, and their son Bam Bam, and their family struggles in the Stone Age and the dawn of civilization. And uh, it's made by Hanna-Barbera. So DC in 2016 was going to put out a Flintstones comic. And for all intents and purposes, you would expect it to be a throwaway book and be terrible and not be good but it was actually one of the best books of the last uh, decade. So uh, how I found the book is I usually read a whole bunch of new comics that come out every week, and I saw there was a new Flintstones number one, so I read it. Because, you know, I like the Flintstones. I'm not a super fan, but I'm aware of the characters, and I want to see how the book was. So I read issue one, and it's not bad. Not bad. Uh, I read issue two when that comes out, and it was pretty good. It was probably my favorite book that came out that week. Like, I read Batman, I read Spider-Man, I read Superman, and the freaking Flintstones was the best book I read that week. It was my pick of the week. Issue 3 comes out, also my pick of the week. Issue 4, also my pick of the week. And it's, it's getting crazy. How is this book so good? And uh, by the end of the 12 issues, it was one of my top books of the decade. The book also got Eisner nominations for Best Humor Publication, Best Limited Series, and Best Writer for Mark Russell. Now, the book is funny, but it's also very deep. Uh, Mark Russell, he has this political social commentary on all of this stuff with society. So it's about society. It's about sex, war, the nature of work, consumerism, marriage, politics, and religion. He's covering all these deep philosophical subjects in the frickin' Flintstones, man. And um, it just kind of blew my mind of, of how much I was having a good time with this series. And uh, I, I've since read almost all of Mark Russell's stuff. So uh, this Prez series he wrote at DC about a teenage president. That was interesting. Um, I've read this Snagglepuss book, another Hanna-Barbera character he wrote. It's called Exit Stage Left, the Snagglepuss Chronicles. Uh, at DC later on, he did a Wonder Twins run, which was just really funny. Over at Dynamite Comics, he's doing Red Sonia right now, which is really good. And uh, he also did a Lone Ranger series, which was really good. Over at Ahoy Comics, he did this book called Second Coming, which was really fun. I actually did a video on issue one of that. You can look it up on my channel. And I went back and I read his novel called God is Disappointed in You. And um, what was interesting about this is that uh, Mark Russell, he has this. Uh, interest in the Bible and Christianity. And he summarized the entire long ass boring Bible in a very digestible way and in a funny way. So you get all the stories in the Bible, but uh, in, a, in a funny way that you can sort of see kind of the ridiculousness of the Bible, but also get some of the messages out of it. So um, I thought that was that was a very interesting book because I'm not going to read the Bible, man. It's way too long, but I'm kind of curious about what's what's in there. So um, that was a good book. And you can see his sort of obsession with religion and interest in religion in this Flintstones book as well, uh, brought out in a very humorous way. So yeah, The Flintstones, this is a, a really great book. I'm excited to go through the story with you all. Uh, it is a very kind of political book, so it might not be for everyone. You might not agree with everything Russell says, but I think he has some very interesting thoughts in this series. So let's dive into the story for The Flintstones. This is a very long video, uh, so you can look at the timestamps in the description to uh, jump to various issues or just watch half of it and come back later and watch the other half. So uh, let's dive into the story. Issue 1, A Clean Slate. This issue has commentary on the nature of work, art, and fate. The story opens in the current day. A tour guide is giving a tour of a museum and shows a caveman named Lorenzo who has been found frozen in ice and preserved. 
This caveman was found in the town of Bedrock, a Stone Age civilization. We jump back in time and we see the town of Bedrock 100,000 years ago, the dawn of civilization. We can see all these funny gags in the background and the funny names and puns of various stores. Russell always writes these little jokes in the background of his books usually, so pay attention to the images as we go through the book as there's so many little jokes in the background that are easy to miss. So we see some of the names of these stores. A bowling alley called Crane's Lanes, a bar named Homo Erectus, a bird store called Trey's Bird Slavery Emporium, uh, Plato's Cave, Starbricks Coffee, uh, so many fun little gags here. We jump over to Slate's Quarry, where you see dinosaurs and various animals and humans working together to extract some stone. Then we see Fred Flintstone. He is, of course, the main character in this story. He is big hearted and also a big dreamer and kind of insecure. And he's constantly trying to prove himself to his family, his friends and the world. He has a job as a worker here at Slate's Quarry. We see Fred Flintstone's boss, George Slate. He's the one that owns and runs this quarry. George calls Fred over and Mr. Slate wants Fred to train these three new Neanderthal cavemen he just hired. Slate whispers to Fred, these guys are twice as strong as Homo sapiens and have no formal concept of money. I want them working here. If this works out, I'm going to need a new foreman. So he is promising Fred a promotion if things go well and Fred is able to train these cavemen to work on the cheap. So Fred phones his wife, Wilma, that's right, they had phones back then, and he tells her that he's going to be late, he has to show these new workers around. Wilma says okay, and we see Wilma at home, she is trying her hand at art, she has some hand print paintings she is doing. Wilma tells Fred not to forget, he has that veterans group to go to tonight. So we learn that Fred and Barney are veterans of something called the Bedrock Wars, where the people of Bedrock went to war with the tree people. So Fred drives by and picks up his best friend and neighbor, Barney Rubble. Barney is a super nice dude, albeit a little bit dim-witted. So Barney gets in the car and asks Fred, why are there these three cavemen in the back? And Fred says he has to show them around for work and get them acquainted with the city and civilization. So Fred and Barney, they head over to their veterans group that they have to go to tonight, and they bring the caveman with them. So the sign on the building reads, Veterans of the Paleolithic Wars. And they have a group where these men talk about the horrors of war and their PTSD. So the one man in this group says, They wouldn't leave the forest. The idea that we wanted their land was completely alien to them. They didn't understand land ownership. The poor bastards didn't stand a chance. We set fire to their trees and when the smoke cleared, they were dead tree people everywhere. So there are some serious moments in this book and we listen to this man talk about his PTSD with the war. It is very similar to the struggles many veterans today deal with the wars that they've been through. After the veterans group though, it's now time for some fun. So Fred and Barney bring the caveman over to the stadium called Madison Square Garden to play on Madison Square Garden. And there they are going to watch a boxing match. So we see they're all watching the match and they love it. They love the violence. And the winning fighter of the match says, I'd like to thank Morp. All good things come from Morp. So this fighter is giving thanks to this god known as Morp, whom we will meet later. After the fight, it's time for some food. And they all head over to the Outback Snake House, a play on Outback Snake House. And we see they are all eating snakes. And Fred says, oh, that fight was great. And Barney replies, man, my favorite part was when he lost consciousness. <laughs> they are all eating their food, and one of the cavemen points to this buffalo running on a nearby treadmill, which apparently powers the fans above them. And the caveman, he points to that buffalo, and he asks, why don't we eat that? And then Fred puzzled and says, you want to eat the air conditioner? So remember in the Flintstones, Various animals usually are used as appliances to humorous effect, and this buffalo is just the air conditioner here, and Fred is puzzled the fact that he would want to eat it. After dinner, one of the caveman's balloons he bought earlier, it popped and got deflated, and the caveman starts crying, and Fred asks what's wrong, and the other caveman says he never had to deal with death before. <laughs> so Fred finally returns home. Wilma is looking at their wedding photo, 
And Wilma asks Fred lovingly, looking at this photo, uh, why do we ever agree to a traditional marriage? And then in the photo, we see Wilma with a blanket over her head and Fred giving some guy three goats to pay for her. This is a parody of some of the archaic marriage dowries that were once commonplace in history. Fred kisses Wilma and says, You were worth every goat. Now Wilma tells Fred that they got an invite to Fred's boss's house for a hot tub party tomorrow night. So next day at work, Mr. Slate is telling Fred to work those cavemen harder. Fred, he gives the cavemen turtle shell helmets and tells them that he's going to start them on pebble duty today. Note the sign in the background here reads, try not to die. Now one of the cavemen asks Fred, why are you wearing a tie? And Fred answers that he read, you should dress for the job you want, not the one you have. So Fred, he clearly wants to be upper management. He wants this foreman promotion. And the caveman asks a follow-up question. Well, how long have you been wearing that tie? And Fred, embarrassed, answers, 15 years. <laughs> so they all work hard for the day, crushing pebble. A bird squawks, it's quitting time for the day. The workday has ended. Fred and the caveman stop by to pick up their money in a sack at the end of the day. And the caveman, confused, asks, what's this? And Fred explains, oh, it's money. And the caveman asks, well, what do we do with it? And Fred answers, I don't know. Buy something someone else hated making? So Fred's shell phone goes on. Get it instead of cell phone. Wilma tells Fred that her handprint art paintings have been accepted into an art exhibit, and she is excited about that. Wilma, she is hanging out with her friend Betty Rubble, wife of Barney Rubble. And Wilma wants to buy some fancy dress for her art exhibit showcase happening later, but she struggles to find anything that works well. It's later on that night, it's time for Mr. Slate's hot tub party. Slate is walking with Fred and they are talking about fate. If things happen for a reason, or is it all just random happenstance? Fred does not believe in fate. He lived through the war. Good soldiers died and bad soldiers lived. It all just seemed kind of random who came out alive in the end. Nothing to do with making your own fate. But Mr. Slate says, that's loser talk. Slate believes in fate. He says, this whole area used to be covered in lava. It took millions of years for all that lava to cool into granite. And thousands of men like you fighting to make bedrock safe for business. Eons of death and destruction. And in the end, my name Slate is all anyone will remember of any of it. He points to the sign that says Slate's quarry hanging over this rock side. That's fate, Flintstone. So Mr. Slate thinks people make their own fate and it is not just random, and he believes that he is a winner, and he thinks he was fated to be this winner, and that thousands of years in the future, his name, Slate, will forever be known. So they are all in a hot tub, and Slate tells his guest, are you guys ready for a life-changing experience? It's called ice cream. Slate yells, Get in here with that ice cream, Philip. Philip the turtle, I guess is Mr. Slate's butler or something, is slowly walking towards the hot tub with a bowl of ice cream on its back. But by the time Philip gets to the hot tub, the ice cream has melted, and Slate angrily tells Philip, get back in the kitchen. Mr. Slate sees a woolly mammoth, and Slate points at it and says, better yet, somebody kill that mammoth and we'll have us some barbecue. We see Mr. Slate's bathing suit is pretty funny, covering his package here. Uh, one of the girls in the hot tub, she gets out, enthusiastically, going to go kill this mammoth, but it's too cold for her. The ground is all snowy and icy here, so she doesn't want to go. So Slate asks one of those new cavemen that he hired to do it. Now the cavemen, they don't want to go over there on the snow and ice. One of the cavemen says, actually, we've had some pretty bad experiences with ice. Eventually, Slate convinces one of the cavemen to go kill this mammoth in exchange for Mr. Slate's necklace. He tells the caveman, You've been eyeballing this necklace all night. Bring me that mammoth and it's yours. Come on, son. This is your fate calling. So the caveman, now wearing Mr. Slate's necklace in exchange for doing this, he heads onto the ice to kill that mammoth. Slate is excited. The caveman is closer to the mammoth. He's getting closer to it. But the ice breaks and the caveman and the mammoth fall through the ice to their deaths. 
The party wraps up on a little bit of a sour note with this caveman dying. Mr. Slate apologizes for the way the evening ended. Slate tells the two remaining cavemen though, with no sensitivity for their friend's recent death. See you guys tomorrow, eh, at work? The two cavemen though are having none of it, and the one says to Mr. Slate, I don't think so, we're gonna be leaving Bedrock. And Slate confused asks why, Bedrock has so much to offer. And the cavemen respond, no offense, but it seems like the whole point of civilization is to just get someone else to do your killing for you. I think we'll pass. Slate is not pleased. Slate tells Fred that he failed him. And once everyone goes home, Slate tells Philip the turtle who is bringing some cake to him. Ugh, oh, you're the only one that understands me, Philip. So Fred and Wilma go to the Bedrock Museum of Art to see Wilma's artwork presented. There are some puns of famous artists, for example, Wilma says, oh look, an Andy Warthog and a David Rockney. Wilma and Fred then go to see Wilma's handprint artwork pieces. Some snobby hipster art critics though comment negatively saying, like the world needs another cave painting. Oh, it's so retro again. Yeah, we get it, sweetheart. So Wilma is devastated that they didn't like her artwork and she explains to Fred the significance of her art. When she was a little girl, her whole tribe would trek south for the winter. It was dangerous and not everyone made it back, but when they returned, their handprints were still there, waiting for them in the cave. And the day that she put her handprint on the cave wall was the day that she became a human being. We see her whole childhood cave is just covered with the handprints of everyone who ever existed in their tribe. Everyone she has ever known and loved. Proof of her place in the universe, so that's why her handprint painting meant so much to her. We jump back to the current day. We see that Lorenzo the Caveman, who we saw in the beginning of the book, on display in this museum. We now know that this caveman was the one that fell through the ice at Mr. Slate's party. And the museum guide explains that this caveman's fancy necklace he is wearing leads us to believe that he was someone very important back then. Who knows, maybe he ran the nearby quarry. And that is how the issue ends. So for all of Mr. Slate's striving for success and talk about fate and wanting to leave an impression on the world, a hundred thousand years in the future, the fact that that caveman was wearing Mr. Slate's necklace, future society thinks that that caveman was actually the important individual and Mr. Slate was just lost to history. Nobody knows him. So this perhaps gives credence to the theory that fate is nothing but random happenstance. Issue two, buyer beware. This issue has some commentary on consumerism and religion. So we are outside the rubble house and we see Bam Bam is being picked on by a bully. Now Bam Bam is the son of Barney and Betty Rubble and he is a really strong kid. In the cartoon, Bam Bam was always a baby, whereas now he is about 13 or 14 years old. Now this bully, his name is Ralph, and he uses a made up catchphrase, which is gonna be a funny recurring gag throughout the book. The bully says, hey kid, give me your money or I'm gonna punch you in the beef. Punching someone in the beef is a stupid line that's gonna be repeated throughout the series and it gets funnier the more you see it. So Bam Bam lifts this bully straight over his head and shows him to his parents. And Barney tells Bam Bam, go play outside with your new friend. The TV is coming on. Fred walks into Barney's house and he tells Barney, hey Barney, here's that rock I owe you. Uh, I love these small little throwaway jokes the book does. So Fred, he sees the TV turn on and he freaks out. This is his first time seeing a TV, and Fred says, Look out, wall demon! Barney explains though that no, this is a TV. It's like having the whole world right in your living room. The newscaster on the TV explains that this is the world's first TV broadcast. The newsman says, Good evening. Fred talks back to it. Hello. Betty explains to Fred that he can't hear you. The newsman says his name is Rock Stone. And in today's news, a man's head was crushed by a rock, and they have a picture of it. And we see this person with their head crushed all gory. And then Rockstone says, Oh, in other news, people everywhere are buying things they don't need. It's called crap, and it's taking bedrock by storm. And then they're interviewing a man on the street, and he says, Yeah, it felt a little, a little weird at first, you know, owning physical objects. 
but now I'm totally into it. I love my crap. Well, now that buying crap is a thing, Fred and his family go to the grand opening over the very first mall in Civilization. Now we see Pebbles Flintstone, the daughter of Fred and Wilma. In the cartoon, she was always a baby while well, they aged her up here as well into a teenager. And uh, they're going to the mall and Wilma, she is looking at the can openers, which is just a bird. A man talks Fred into buying something called a Power Goat 3000, which is just a weed whacker. And Pebbles, she goes to the record store and is talking music. The song playing in the store goes, Gonna pump that rump, gotta bump that rump, yo rump is a riddle that got me stumped. Fred and Wilma walk into the store to retrieve Pebbles and they hear that song and they hate it and they want to get out of there. So the family arrive home with all their new crap. Pebbles is listening to music. Wilma can't wait to try out her new dishwasher, which is just a gigantic octopus. Fred takes the Power Goat 3000 out for a spin in the backyard. And then he puts the Power Goat in his garage and says, glad I don't have to do that for another week. And the goat is kind of concerned that he's just going to be left there living in that garage for another week. It's now time for church. Reverend Tom is in charge here, and he tells everyone, Morp bless you. The church sign reads, First Church of Animism, you can't enter heaven unless Morp enters you. So inside, the reverend explains that when they were nomads, Morp would lead them south for winter, and north again for cooler lands in the summer. And Morp, he would stop at lakes and streams, showing us where to drink. So Morp is just this bird and they all treat it as their god. And the reverend says, What other proof of Morp's love do you need? Now my children, I went to the mall today, and this might be the most important event in the history of our religion. The reverend bought a record player, and he gets Morp to play the record off of his beak. And the reverend tells the crowd, Prepare yourselves, for we shall now finally hear the voice of Morp. And it is that crazy song that was playing in the record store earlier that day. Round like a hump, bump in that rump. Girl, turn around, let me grab a clump. So Fred and Wilma and the rest of the people in attendance at the church are not impressed with the words of Morp. And as they leave the church, Fred comments, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to take Morp seriously anymore. And Wilma responds, yeah, it was fun while it lasted. So Wilma and Pebbles are going to go shopping again, but Fred just stays home, but all the new animal appliances are kind of freaking him out. The can opener hisses at him. So Fred decides to go out. He goes to the veterans hall and he confides in Barney that all this crap is ruining him. He's not making enough money down at the quarry to keep up. But Wilma seems to love all this crap and he doesn't want to let her down. One of the other veterans there slyly says to Fred, you looking to make a little extra pebble? He ropes Fred into this pyramid scheme of selling vitamins. He later on gives Fred a suitcase of the vitamins and tells him, it's good to have an angle to use when you sell these vitamins. You know, being a war vet could help you, those sad vet eyes. So Fred and Barney, they both accept these vitamins and are going to sell vitamins on their spare time for some extra money. Back at church once again, the reverend, he tells the crowd, Alright, clearly Morp was a false god, but I think we found a new nice animal god you will all enjoy. And he reveals a pink elephant named Peaches. And the people in the crowd ask, What does Peaches want from us? And the reverend responds, Uh, he just wants everyone to get along and have a good time. So the people, they all cheer. They love this new god. After church, Betty says, I think I'm going to like worshiping Peaches. So cute! Later on, Fred is returning to the mall to return some crap. Fred, embracing this religion, has a Peaches Saves bumper sticker on his car, spoofing those Jesus Saves bumper stickers you see today. Fred goes to one of those booths and has his garbage disposable with him, which is just a giant lizard creature. Fred tells the clerk, I'd like to return this garbage disposal. And the clerk responds, uh, it's pretty old. We're going to have to recycle it. And Fred says, okay. He also wants a bag of appliance food for all of his animal appliances. And it's funny, when the clerk says we'll have to recycle the animal, he gives the lizard to his associate, who takes the animal out back with a club weapon, implying that he's just going to beat the animal to death. Sure enough, they offer Fred some assorted meat for a discounted price if he wants. 
and Fred takes them up on their offer, not realizing he just bought the meat of his dead garbage disposal. Now Wilma, also at the mall with Fred, she sees a little pink elephant on sale. And shocked, she tells Fred, I think we're worshipping a vacuum cleaner. So we see that Peaches, their new god at church, is actually just a vacuum cleaner the Reverend bought here at the mall. So the next time at church, Fred confronts the Reverend publicly about all of them worshipping a vacuum cleaner. And the Reverend says, look, I understand you're upset, but I was in a pinch. Isn't it important that God makes you feel like your life has meaning? Does it really matter what form he takes? The people are not happy, and the reverend says, Come on, we've done good work in this church. Just because some god didn't pan out, you're not going to go back to smashing people with clubs, are you? And one practitioner enthusiastically stands up and says, I am. The people leave angry, and Fred says, Call us when you get a real god. So the two priests are brainstorming new god ideas. And they say, ugh, we can't leave this room until we come up with a credible god. Dinosaurs. Everyone loves dinosaurs. We could do that. Or maybe a rabbit. And the one priest says, hey, I think I've got something. And he holds up a blank piece of paper. And the other priest says, but it's completely blank. And the other priest with the paper says, exactly. Thus, their new god it was created an imaginary god that you can't see or give form to. I think this is a commentary about how in most modern religions, God doesn't have a known form. We may imagine an old white man with a gray beard, but for the most part, God's image is unknown. And that is kind of what these priests figured out. You can't criticize a god. You can't fully present a god that is just an idea. The priest put their old god Peaches out to work as a vacuum cleaner. Fred. He's trying to sell those vitamins door to door and is failing over and over again. He does finally manage to sell one bottle to some hippie who thinks they're drugs, but it's not going well for him. Barney though, he's selling tons of these vitamins because he is presenting his son Bam Bam's strength and is leading everyone to believe his son is so strong because he's eating these vitamins. So that's why he's selling so many of them. Back at the church, the priest reveals their new god to everyone, the invisible god. And the people ask, mm, what's his name? And the priest responds, uh, I haven't really thought that far. For now, let's just call him Gerald. And from now on, everyone is going to be worshipping Gerald. Fred and Barney, they go to collect their vitamin money from the vitamin guy for all their sales. Barney did well, he sold tons, but Fred only got one pebble and is upset. And the vitamin guy explains, Fred, you only sold one bottle of vitamins. And Fred, he's yelling in frustration and says, I work at the quarry all day and sell vitamins all night and for what? A power goat? Later on at home, Fred tells Wilma that he's sorry, but he can't afford all this crap they're buying. And Wilma tells Fred, oh, Fred, it's okay. Nothing we buy is going to make me happy. And then Fred asks her, well, what makes you happy? And Wilma says, Human beings are just a walking accumulation of love and regret. The only thing that ever made me happy is being next to someone who loves me. And she tells Fred, we don't need any of this stuff. Just get rid of anything that makes your life harder. So Fred, he goes back to the mall by himself and returns a lot of the stuff he bought. So he returns the power goat and the dishwasher. And the clerk tells him, hey, this dishwasher only has seven tentacles, not eight. And Fred says, it was like that when I got it. And the clerk says, only store credit for that one. Fred, he doesn't want anything else in the store, though. But the clerk says, just pick something, man. And Fred asks, well, what about that? And the guy says, you're sure? He's part of a discontinued line. We were just going to recycle him. And Fred asks, well, what does he do? And the clerk answers, nothing. And Fred says, perfect, I'll take him. And for those of you familiar with the cartoon, this is Fred's sort of dinosaur dog. And he is named Dino. And in this continuity, this is how the Flintstones came to get Dino. Issue 3, A Space Oddity. This issue has some social commentary on science, space exploration, spring break, and lack of good care for veterans. So Pebbles is on a class trip to the Cave of Science and Technology. There, the Professor Sargon is teaching the kids about space and how there are literally hundreds of stars in our galaxy. The joke being that they're of course actually billions, but they only think there are hundreds at this point. He also tells the students 
that some think the Earth rotates around the sun. But the prevailing theory is that the Earth sits on the back of a giant turtle. And Pebbles asks, well, what's the turtle resting on? And the professor says, well, obviously the turtle rotates in space orbiting the sun. The professor reveals a monkey in a space suit, which they are going to be launching into space in the hopes of finding other turtle-based worlds. Well, they launch this monkey into space by dropping a heavy dinosaur on one end of a board and launching the monkey away into the sky. As Pebbles and Bam Bam head on to the bus at the end of this school trip, Pebbles asks, did they just kill a chimp to impress a bunch of 8th graders? Later on, Fred and Wilma are watching the news, and it turns out launching the monkey into space was detected by some aliens who have now landed in bedrock, and they introduce themselves to the people. The aliens say, hello, and explain that they are explorers on a mission of discovery, and they will not interfere in the humans' primitive ways. The townspeople come to see the aliens. Mr. Slate tells them, hey, if you ever need a puppet dictator, I'm your guy. The aliens are not interested in enslaving the planet, though, and they leave. On the spaceship, the aliens, unimpressed, say, whatever, let's just add this planet to the Galactopedia and move on. These aliens are going to come back into the story later. Later on, Fred, Barney, and their old war vet buddies are talking about the aliens and what the aliens want. Barney thinks that the aliens are going to try and colonize the Earth. The other war vet says, well, one good thing about these aliens is now that we know we're not alone anymore in the universe, people might take us as soldiers seriously again. Maybe realize they still need us? Remember when the Bedrock Wars ended? We were Gerald damned heroes for about a week. And they promised to take care of us. But the moment they didn't need us anymore, we were forgotten about. And this war vet, he, we see he couldn't even get a job at a bowling alley because he doesn't have enough experience with armadillos needed. Because they use armadillos as bowling balls here. This other war vet named Joe, he is struggling emotionally. He phones this suicide hotline, but he's put on hold. And the phone line says, you've reached the veteran suicide hotline. Please hold. And the veteran that was contemplating suicide says, Okay, but this hold music better be pretty damn good. So we see these veterans are struggling and they have not been taken care of after the war. Some time passes and the aliens come back, only it's no longer the alien explorers. Now it is just a rowdy group of aliens on galactic break, which is like spring break. And they are here on Earth to party. The aliens are saying... Dude, it's just like we saw on Galactopedia. Galactic break, woo! The one alien tries to push Mr. Slate and tells his girlfriend, Are you getting this, Zorna? So the alien galactic breakers are clearly dicks. Back at the Flintstone house, one of the aliens vomits in Fred's window. Fred, angry, goes to the police department to file a report. And we see some aliens there are getting arrested. And just like any rowdy spring breakers would, one alien arguing with a cop says, Zordak is my bro, man. We've been bros since sophomore year. He's like a bro to me. Do me a multidimensional solid. And the cop says, no, he's not going to. So the alien decides to disintegrate the cop with his death ray. Fred, in response, says, holy Gerald. Remember... Their god is now known as Gerald, so now when they curse or praise God, they now curse or praise Gerald. Pebbles and Bam Bam are wandering around town, but they see all these aliens being obnoxious. And we see this one alien says to the other, Yo man, you gotta get this Disintegrate app. It's a totally sweet death ray app. So on their devices, they have apps like phone apps that can be used to destroy people. Pebbles and Bam Bam not wanting to be around all these aliens, they decide to go somewhere where no alien tourist would dare go. They decide to go to the Cave of Science and Technology to get away from everyone. You see Fred, he leaves the police station, and the alien galactic breakers are death raying everyone just for fun. We see them luring humans into certain areas and lasering them and laughing once the humans get killed. Fred runs home and says to Wilma, Where's Pebbles? On the TV, the reporters are talking about how the aliens are killing with impunity. The other newscaster says, Well, 
to be fair and balanced, they are stimulating the funeral economy. Wilma, wondering where her daughter is, she sees that she has a voicemail on her phone, which is just, the voicemail is just a parrot in a, in a box. And she plays the parrot and the parrot says, Hi mom, hi dad. Bam Bam and I are going to the science cave until this alien thing blows over. So Fred hears this and he's determined to go save the kids, but he's gonna need some help. We see Pebbles and Bam Bam down at the science cave. They're talking to Professor Sargon and tell him that they're hiding from the aliens. And Sargon tells them, mm, that's probably a good move. When confronted by bullies, it's best to hide and hope they go away. Bam Bam says that the two of them are acting like a bunch of geek lords. He says to the professor, Look man, the three of us can take this town back, but we'll need the most dangerous technology you have, professor. Bam Bam in his head is envisioning fire-breathing lizards that they can use as weapons. But the professor says the most dangerous technology he has is the coffee maker. Bam Bam worried says, Then how are we supposed to fight off these space bros? Pebbles points to a satellite dish and says, Maybe we don't have to fight them. Maybe we just have to tattle on them. He jumped to the veterans hall. They were in some sort of support group with a psychiatrist of sorts. One of the war vets who's struggling says that when someone bumps into a shopping cart at Trapper Joe's, he starts hyperventilating. The psychiatrist replies, Everyone here remember that little nonsense phrase I taught you to help deal with these tense situations? And the veterans group repeats the phrase, Yabba dabba do! The psychiatrist says, That's right, whatever the challenge is, you can do it. In fact, you can yabba dabba do it. For those of you familiar with the Flintstones, yabba dabba do was Fred Flintstone's catchphrase, although it never really had a real meaning or explanation behind it. Well, Mark Russell here in this book makes it a nonsense phrase that the veterans have been taught to use to help relax their mind which I think is kind of a fun idea. So Fred, he bursts into the veterans group and asks them for their help with the aliens. He needs his fellow soldiers help to take these aliens down and save the kids. Fred also makes sure to get Joe, that one vet who was on the suicide hotline, and make sure that he helps. Back at the science cave, Pebbles trying to send a message through this makeshift pterodactyl satellite dish She's trying to send a signal back to the alien's mother world, explaining how poorly behaved all the alien galactic breakers are being, and she's trying to tell on them. The aliens on the street hear the message and try to stop it from getting out and getting to their parents, so they start trying to attack the science cave. But Fred, Barney, and the other war veterans show up with their primitive rock guns and shoot the aliens back. One of the aliens tries to grab Pebbles, but Joe, that war vet that was struggling with suicidal thoughts, he tackles the alien, saving Pebbles, but he gets death raid in the process and dies. As stuff is heating up, all of a sudden the alien mothership arrives on Earth and tells the aliens, you kids are in big trouble. Now get aboard, you've got school on Monday. So all the galactic breakers are forced to return home. The aliens have left. The town is saved. The mayor of the city says to the crowd, Well, our first meeting with an alien civilization was a little bit of a mixed bag, but to make sure this never happens again, the aliens have left this man behind. And he introduces a green alien known as the Great Gazoo, which roughly translates to Game Warden. In the TV show, the Great Gazoo was a silly character only in the last season of the show, and he was an alien from this planet Zatox sent to prehistoric Earth as punishment and forced to serve Fred and Barney, and he can only be seen by a few people. And he was very much a silly character. The character is portrayed very differently here, with a slightly different origin. So, the Great Gazoo, he is going to be staying here on Earth and serve as Earth's protector from other alien worlds that might be coming to the planet, and make sure that Earth isn't overrun by galactic breakers in the future. The mayor then says, now this is long overdue, but we would also like to take this moment to honor a fallen hero. Fred and Barney perk up. They are happy. They think the mayor is going to acknowledge their fallen veteran Joe who gave his life to save Pebbles. But the mayor instead salutes and says, Sergeant Grumbles, 
as he reveals a statue of that monkey that was launched into space in the beginning of this issue. And that is who the mayor is actually saluting. And the crowd applauds, except of course for Fred and Barney. Issue 4, Domestications. This issue has social commentary on marriage and gay marriage. Pebbles is playing with Dino. The animal appliances are all jealous that Dino doesn't have to work like them. Fred and Wilma are watching TV. The anchorman, Rock Stone, says, More and more people have been abandoning the traditional sex cave for exclusive partnerships known as marriage. The female anchor woman says, And what do you think about marriage, Rock? And Rock answers, I think it's an immoral threat to our way of life. He is asked why, and he says, Because it wasn't around when I was a kid. This is an interesting commentary on gay marriage. Why is marriage between a man and a woman the accepted cultural norm, but gay marriage is not? Well, in this bedrock society, traditional man-woman marriage is considered new and weird because the people of bedrock are just used to something called a sex cave. And the anchorman says, Marriage is an immoral threat to his way of life because it wasn't around when he was a kid, which is a simplistic swipe at conservative values which are often rooted on dated principles and the refusal to move to a new way of thinking. Fred and Wilma are outside loading up their car. Two old men walking by say, Ugh, married people. Disgusting. Go back to the sex cave like nature intended. Wilma drops Pebbles off at the Rubble's house to stay with them. Her and Fred are going away for the week. As Fred and Wilma are driving away, they see two friends of theirs, Adam and Steve, and decide to say hello to them. If you are familiar with bigoted anti-gay marriage arguments that use the Bible, they often say, God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Well, right here are Adam and Steve. Fred and Wilma talk to them for a minute, and Fred and Wilma say that they're going to a marriage retreat, and Adam says that him and Steve were thinking about getting married as well, and Fred says you should. Fred and Wilma then head off. A humorous sign reads, Agriculture. The food just pops right out of the ground. So agriculture is one of these newfangled things in this era of civilization. So Fred and Wilma are at the marriage retreat, run by one of those weird priests of Gerald. The priest tells them, we're trailblazers, pioneers of monogamy. The idea of marriage makes some people uncomfortable, but it's all part of Gerald's plan for our lives and the foundation upon which we shall build our society. The priest asks this old couple, How long have you guys been married? And they say, 30 years. We were early adopters, and like most early adopters, we got screwed. They do not look happy. There is a young couple. They are not married, but they're thinking about it. But they are hesitant. And the priest says, Come on, it's just a legal partnership with someone you're having sex with. Totally nothing to worry about. The old couple is arguing some more, and the unhappy old married dude tells the young kids, this is your future. Behold your future, kids. He is warning them about not getting married. The priest then turns his attention to Fred and Wilma and asks Fred what worries him. And Fred says, I worry that Wilma will stop loving me. I mean, marriage is like insurance. You only enter into a lifetime commitment because you're afraid of the future. But does being married mean she'll love me forever? Or is it just my attempt to keep her from finding someone better? Is marriage really a sacred bond or just the illusion of security? The priest, not ready to answer Fred's philosophical pondering, says, Okay, uh, thanks, Fred. Did I mention that there's zip lining here? Which is a parody of these weird retreats where they often have odd activities to keep people entertained, like, like zip lining. Now we have a little side plot with the animal appliances at the Flintstones' home. The snake says, All the humans are gone. The bird lamp replies, Yeah, I don't think they're coming back. Moose Coat Rack then gleefully dumps all the stuff that was hanging on his antlers. Armadillo Bowling Ball says, Hey look, it's Garbage Disposal. Garbage Disposal Lizard walks out saying, What up, appliance? The bird lamp acting tough says, Good thing they left or I would have thrown their sorry asses out myself. And the turtle table says to that, Appliance, please! And Dino talks with all the animal appliances and asks what they're talking about. But the appliances say nothing. They don't fully trust Dino. 
But Turtle Table says, Look, there's no way the humans have left for good without Uncle Dino. They'll be back in a day or two, probably. The Moose Coat Rack says, Rats! Guys, can you help me get these coats back on, then? And Garbage Disposal says, Well, it was fun while it lasted. And the appliances go back to sleep. Armadillo, though, Armadillo Bowling Ball, he hears some cries of help from the closet. And Bowling Ball opens the door, and it's a pink elephant vacuum cleaner. The elephant vacuum cleaner was scared being in the closet where it's all dark, and no one ever talks to him in there. The bowling ball asks, you don't have any friends in there? And the elephant asks, what's a friend? Who are you? And the armadillo explains that he is Fred's bowling ball. And the elephant asks, what's a bowling ball? And armadillo answers, it's hard to explain. Elephant vacuum cleaner then asks armadillo bowling ball, are we friends now? So this is all a very cute little side plot. We will learn more about the saga of the appliances, an armadillo bowling ball, an elephant vacuum cleaner as the series goes on. We jump to Pebbles. She is at the Rubbles household now that her parents are on vacation. She's eating breakfast with them. And Betty asks her, what are they teaching you in school? And Pebbles says, they're teaching us how to sit down and shut up. And Barney responds, oh, those are the skills that made me what I am today. At the Bedrock Town Hall, angry citizens are yelling at the mayor about this new marriage thing. And they say, it's an affront to decency. If we allow men and women to marry, how long before they start marrying dinosaurs and street lamps? It's a slippery slope. A concerned woman asks, what about the children? <laughs> the mayor responds, I understand your concerns, but frankly, we have more important things to worry about. Like everything else than this issue. Every issue is more important than this. The angry mob decides to take this into their own hands then, and they storm off. Back at the marriage retreat, Wilma says that she married Fred because he was the man that she loved. She never really thought about it beyond that. And this young woman asks, remind me, what is the point of marriage? Why can't we just, you know, live together? And the priest answers, well, don't you want your partner to support you when you're old and ugly? And the priest says to the young man, and when she has a baby, don't you want to know for sure that you're the father? And then the young woman angrily says to that, Hey, what are you implying about me? The priest continues to explain what the benefits of marriage is, but he is clearly failing. Eventually, that angry mob from the town hall shows up with signs that read, Marriage is unnatural. One man plus one woman equals two weird. And my favorite sign, spoofing those God hates fags people, is a sign that says, God hates dads. The fighting eventually ensues between the protesters and the married people. The old married couple who seem to not like each other, even the husband won't stand for people yelling at his wife, so he defends his wife to these protesters. The priest then explains his position to the protesters and he says, Look, I admit it, marriage could turn out to be this horrible mistake, but how are we supposed to deal with a changing world if we don't try new things? We're not asking you to change your beliefs, just that you respect our right to succeed or fail on our own. The protesters admit that maybe they overreacted a little bit, and they walk away. The old married couple who hate each other reconcile and begin making out. Adam and Steve show up, and they decide that they too would like to get in on this whole getting married thing. And the priest of Gerald says, what? Sorry, but no freaking way. So this priest, he's fine with a man and woman marrying, but two dudes marrying? He's not cool with that. And Wilma, shocked, tells the priest, but what about your plea for tolerance and understanding you made like three seconds ago? And the priest says, but the whole point of marriage is to breed more humans and they can't breed. And Fred to this says, look, I don't want to do anything if Adam and Steve aren't welcome. And the priest says to Fred, why is that so important to you? And Fred explains, in his tribe of hunter-gatherers when he was growing up, life was always a struggle, and it wasn't always possible for people to take care of their own kids. So the non-breeders gave their tribe extra hands to help with the children, and having them around often meant the difference between life and death. Our tribe, maybe even our species, wouldn't have made it through without guys like Adam and Steve. That's the sort of thing a human being should remember, or ought to. The priest contemplates this and says, Well, I guess I have a lot of thinking to do, but I probably won't. And he walks away. 
Fred and Wilma then leave the marriage retreat, and when they return home, they see a happily excited Dino to see them, and they all pet Dino. And the other animal appliances, seeing Dino being given all this attention, say to themselves, I am filled with disgust. <laughs> Grown, get a room. Issue 5, Election Day. We have social commentary on politics, voting, and war in this issue. So, tomorrow is election day in Bedrock for the next mayor of the city. The anchor tells everyone, remember, your vote counts, whether you know what you're doing or not. There is also an election going on at the school for class president. The bully Ralph, he is running, and he threatens the other students, and his sign reads, Vote for me or I'll punch you in the beef. Now we see they are holding a mayoral debate. The questions asked to the candidates is, As mayor, how would you respond to the threat posed by the lizard people? The current mayor says, Well, we need to think this through before doing something rash. The crowd does not like that answer. And they say, Those lizard people ate my ferns! Apparently, the lizard people have been eating people's ferns? Ferns are like that leafy type plant. Now Claude the Destroyer, the other mayoral candidate, he says, History is written in the blood of our enemies. And the debate moderator says, Now, you are called Claude the Destroyer, but isn't that just because you are the son of Mordok the Destroyer? Have you ever actually destroyed anything? And Claude deflects and says, Claude's name is not issue here. Lizard people are our issue. Children of Claude. You shall taste the wine of victory. The lizard people shall be vanquished, and it will be easy. The crowd cheers and says, He says the things I wish were true. I think Mark Russell, by making Claude the Destroyer say, It will be easy, is a parody of Trump, and when Trump was campaigning, he would always say everything was going to be so easy for him to do. Healthcare, so easy. So, uh, a little jab here at Trump. After the debate... Fred and Barney are at Starbricks drinking some coffee, and Barney comments about how all of this strong talk, Claude the Destroyer talking about fighting the lizard people, it's all so familiar and reminds him of their war with the tree people back in the day. Fred, ashamed of that war, says that they participated in a genocide with that war with the tree people. We get a flashback to several years ago, before Bedrock was even a town, and everyone just lived in huts. We see Fred, Wilma, Barney, and Betty are together. They're in a tent playing a board game called Tusco. Later on, Fred asks Barney if him and Betty are thinking of having kids, and Barney says that they are thinking about it, but we learn that Barney apparently has slow sperm, so he's incapable of having children. We see Mr. Slate, he is trying to propose something to the people here. He asks them, Aren't you tired of living in fur tents? I mean, look at those poor jerks in Yak Village. I mean, just look at them. And he points to these people that are literally just a few meters away from him. And they say, Hey, we like it here. Mr. Slate says that the people here should build a city of stone and call it Bedrock. They just have to get rid of those scummy trees sitting on top of all that granite and the tree people that live in those trees. A young guy with an afro says, No blood for granite! And Mr. Slate says, I appreciate your concerns, dirt hippie, but the reality is more complicated. Mr. Slate then introduces Mordok the Destroyer, the father of Claude the Destroyer. Mordok the Destroyer starts trying to stoke people's fears about the tree people so that they will want to go to war with them. Mordok says, Tree people strong and crafty. They watch us from their trees waiting. Perhaps they will come out of their trees to sell their pinecone art? Or maybe they will come out to burn you alive as they devour the flesh of your children. Who knows, but do you really want to find out? So join my army and eliminate the threat. Save yourselves from destruction. Plus, there are free hats. So I think this is some commentary showing that politicians and leaders like Mr. Slate and like Mordok the Destroyer and Claude the Destroyer are manipulating people to go to war for them. You can draw comparisons to what they are saying and maybe to what George Bush said about the war in Iraq for oil or many other wars in history. Just lying to the people to get them to do what you want and making them fear this unknown enemy. 
Mr. Slate and Mordok the Destroyer, they just want to build the city of Bedrock, but they need the citizens to join the war effort and kill the tree people in order for them to do so. And the only way to do so is to get the people to hate and fear the tree people, despite not knowing they are truly dangerous or not. As Mordok the Destroyer said about the tree people, perhaps they will come out of their trees to sell us their pine cone art, or maybe they will come out to burn you alive as they devour the flesh of your children. Who knows? But do you really want to find out? So an interesting example of a way to sway the people using fear. Still in the flashback, Fred tells Barney that he is going to enlist in the war effort against the tree people. Barney doesn't know if he's going to join up though. And Fred tells Barney, what's the matter? Are you scared? And Barney says, well, yeah, I'm scared. And Betty and I are in love and I have a good life and that seems like a lot to give up for a granite countertop. And Fred says, and when the tree people come for you and Betty? And Barney says, but they don't even know me. And Fred says to Barney, look, if you're not going to step up and fight for the ones you love, then what good are you? Just go home. Barney, though, he eventually changes his mind and decides to join up for the war effort as well. Jumping back to the current day, at school, we see Ralph the bully is collecting people's lunch money, but Bam Bam just picks Ralph up and throws him high into the sky. Pebbles and Bam Bam are hanging out for lunch at school, and they get interrupted by a dweeby looking kid. The dweeby kid says, can I interest you in some literature on Ralph the bully? Ralph wants to cut red tape and create new opportunities by getting rid of all these playground monitors. And Pebbles responds to this kid, can you really be this stupid? Ralph has taken your lunch money how many times? Aren't you sick of being pushed around? And the dweeby kid says, Damn right I am. That's why I'm joining him. And Ralph comes by and he puts his arms around the dweeby kid. So it's funny how Ralph the bully is getting these kids, these nerds, to give around his literature on his policies uh, if he is elected school council president. We are going back in time once again, another flashback to the war with the tree people. Fred and Barney are having their war training. Their drill sergeant, he lines everyone up and tells them, about a quarter of you aren't gonna make it through this war. Do I have any brave men here? Show of hands. A few raise their hands and the drill sergeant says, yeah, you're the ones who are probably gonna die first. He continues, I don't know what they said to get you all to sign up. Maybe they promised you a career. Maybe you are here for the sweet hats. But when you are charged by a hundred raging tree people, none of that matters. You are all going to fight now to save the men on either side of you. From this moment on, we are a family. So their training consists of fighting a gorilla, going across these monkey bars. The drill sergeant says, do not give up on those monkey bars. Monkey bars are victory. Monkey bars are life. <laughs> he then shows them a wooden fort. And Fred says, sir, there's no way we can possibly climb that. The drill sergeant doesn't want them to climb it, though. He is going to teach them their most important weapon against the tree people, fire. And he sets this big fort on fire. And Fred says, oh, he gets it now. So the fighting with the tree people then commences. The tree people in the beginning are just kind of minding their own business. But then Fred and his people attacked them, so the tree people were forced to fight back, and they would disappear into the trees when they needed to. Back to the current day once again. The school council president candidates are having their debate. First is Ralph the Bully's opponent, a little kid named Portnoy. Portnoy, he gives a speech and ends by saying, In closing, if we cover the playground with a net, I believe we could reduce the number of kids who get carried off by pterodactyls to like, one a year, two tops. Now is Ralph the Bully's turn for his speech, and he says, It's simple. Nothing cool ever gets done because you're led by pukes and weaklings. I'm strong. I say and I do what I want because I can get away with it. If I'm president, nobody will push us around, and if they do, I'll punch them in the beef. You think pork body over there is going to protect you? I mean, look at him. Ralph then says, what are you going to do, pork body? Cry? And Portnoy says, probably. Ralph then tells him, go ahead, cry. Portnoy then cries, and he tells the teacher he wants to withdraw from the race. <laughs> the teacher is sorry to hear that. 
So Portnoy is out of the race now, and it looks like Ralph is going to be automatically elected school council president because he's the only one running. But Pebbles raises her hand, and she tells her fellow students, Come on, you deserve better than this. Maybe Ralph's right. Maybe our problem is that we elect leaders who can be bullied. But your solution is to elect the bully himself? You know what? I take it back. If you don't have the guts to stand up to Ralph, then maybe you don't deserve better than this. Enjoy getting punched in the beef for the next 12 months. All the other students, impressed that Pebbles is not scared of Ralph and is standing up to him, they offer to vote for her. She seems to have swayed the majority of the school. So Pebbles is most likely going to win the vote. Ralph tells her, I'm going to destroy you, Flintstone. But Bam Bam just carries Ralph away. Ralph, scared of Bam Bam, says, I'm going to destroy you metaphorically, of course. Pebbles says to Bam Bam later on, You know, I actually thought that pterodactyl net was a good idea. Ralph, realizing that he has lost, goes over to that dweeby kid that was helping him earlier, and he says, Nice work, loser! And Ralph punches the kid in the stomach, and the dweeby kid says, Ah, my beef! <laughs> Back to the flashback. The sergeant tells the men, The tree people are gathering for an all-out attack tomorrow, but we're going to hit them first. Needless to say, a lot of us aren't going to make it, so tonight, eat as much applesauce as you want. The next morning, Fred and his men line up to fight the tree people. The fighting is intense. Fred and his soldiers get surrounded. The sergeant tells them, Hold tight! Armored support is on the way! A T-Rex then comes charging through. That is their armored support. After the battle, Fred and his soldiers look like they have won. They can go back to their home, to their families. We see the tree people have been killed, and their bodies have been burned. Fred and his men look at the carnage. Fred is upset though. He says, We weren't protecting our families by coming here and attacking them. Everything they told us about the tree people, about them invading us, is a lie. We were attacking them. And Barney asks, How do you know? Fred, he picks up the burnt remains of a children's toy, and he says, Because who brings children to an invasion? So Fred, realizing that they were just attacking innocents, he feels really bad, and he feels like his superiors forced him to commit a genocide here of these tree people. Barney, he is looking through this forest, and he sees a small baby in a tree, and he tells Fred, I found something, a survivor. Barney, he grabs the baby out of the tree. Back in the current day, we see on the local TV there, Claude the Destroyer has won the mayoral election in a landslide. And Fred, not happy with his news, says, I knew we would make the same mistakes, but I never thought we'd forget them. Things have never been the same for me since that war. That day in the forest changed me forever, Barney. And Barney says to Fred, Me too, Fred. Me too. We go back to that flashback of the war. Barney brings that baby that he found in the forest of the tree people. And he brings that baby home to him and Betty. And they are going to care for that baby like it is their own. And that is the story of how Barney and Betty adopted Bam Bam. At least in this version of the Flintstones. Issue 6. The End of the World as We Know It. Fred and Wilma are at the mall. They are eating some freshly cooked panda at Panda Excess, which is a play on Panda Express. Later on at church, they change the name to the First Church of Gerald and a sign below that says, Gerald loves you. Anchor Rock Stone on TV says, Thanks to civilization, things have never been better. Brain clubbings are down 3%, Grand Theft Wheel down 7%, and Witchery down 8%. Human beings have never lived in such peace and prosperity. Wilma asks Fred, Do you think civilization has made us better people? And Fred responds, I don't know, Wilma, but at least there's bowling. Fred, of course, an avid bowler. Next day, Fred works hard at the quarry. He is super tired and he collects his pay. He gets paid in rocks. He then goes to the bowling alley and he tells Barney that work was brutal today. And he bowls his frustrations away. Then at the end of that day, Armadillo, who is Fred's bowling ball, remember? Armadillo tells his new friend, Elephant Vacuum Cleaner, that today was brutal. Elephant asks him, So what happens when Fred takes you out at night? 
and Armadillo explains, I don't know how to explain it. He rolls me across the floor as hard as he can for no reason at all. I've tried to figure out how to make him stop, stop making him so angry, but nothing seems to make a difference. Then I get swept into a dark tunnel and I think this is it. This is where I die. But then I come out the other side and the horror show starts all over again. Armadillo then pontificates, is this my life? Is this all I mean to the universe? Elephant responds, you know, when they're finished vacuuming the floor, the humans just stick me back in the closet, and I have no idea when I'll ever see daylight again, but you know what keeps me going there in the dark? Knowing that my friend Bowling Ball is on the other side of that door. It makes me think, maybe the only meaning to life is that which we get from each other. So by listening to this conversation between Armadillo Bowling Ball and Elephant Vacuum Cleaner, they basically answer the question to what is the meaning of life. Life is shitty, it's not fair, it's hard work, and it sucks, but life is not about that. Life is about what we get from each other and our relationships with other people. Professor Sargon is at the mall, he's the scientist. He sees Pebbles and Bam Bam there. He's excited to show them this new fancy gadget he bought. He's never had so much computing power at his fingertips. We see he has an abacus called Apple Kiss. The joke being that it looks like it's made by Apple. And an abacus is this ancient technology used to sort of do math calculations using beads on this weird device here. The professor asks Pebbles and Bam Bam if they want to work for him down at the science cave. Bam Bam asks, you mean we'll be paid scientists and everything? And Professor Sargon replies, even better than being paid, you'll be interns. So they agree, and they're all back at the science cave. The professor then fires his assistant because he'd rather have these unpaid interns. Sargon, he then takes an early lunch and leaves the cave to Pebbles and Bam Bam for an hour. When Sargon returns from his lunch, all these moths he was experimenting on have gotten out of their net and are flying all around the science cave. Sargon is a little frustrated by that, but Pebbles says the moths will calm down once they go into their breeding cycle. So Sargon, he turns to his new Apokis and his astronomy projections he was doing with it. And he makes a horrible discovery. And on the news the next day, Rockstone announces Professor Sargon's horrible discovery that an asteroid is on a collision course with Earth and Professor Sargon projects it will wipe out all life in exactly three days' time. The anchor flips out. Everyone in the town reacts to the end of the world news. Fred, Bernie, and Wilma and Betty are freaking out. Bam Bam and Pebbles are let go from their job in the science cave. Mr. Slate, he thanks all of his employees and he says that he puts so much time into work, he doesn't have much family or friends, so he asks if anyone wants to hang out at his mansion waiting for the end of the world to come. Everyone just leaves though. At church, the priest says, do not blame Gerald for your imminent death. One of the people in the crowd says, why not? Doesn't he control everything? If Gerald can't save us from an asteroid, then what good is he? The priest tells the crowd, do not listen to this troubled man. The guy in the crowd says, oh no you don't. You've been preaching to me for a long time now, now I get to preach at you. It's what's known as a preach-around. I gave up clubbing people for Gerald, and I love clubbing people. Now that I need Gerald, where is he? Anarchy then breaks out in the church. The guy who loves clubbing people clubs someone in the back of the head. Everyone is just running around. Fred, Wilma, Pebbles, and the priest all head outside of the church. Fred sees a cop, and he asks the cop to do something. But the police officer doesn't want to spend his last few hours filling out paperwork. He tells Fred that he's on his own. Fred and his family head to the mall. The anarchy continues there. People looting. The pandas from Panda Excess are running loose. Fred comments, this is terrible. Everything we believed in is gone. Pebbles then says, maybe not. She heads to the science cave. Pebbles tells Professor Sargon, just tell the people you were wrong with your calculations. Let them live out their last few days with dignity. And Professor Sargon says, I can't lie to the people just to make them feel better about their mortality. The priest says, sure you can, it's easy. <laughs> Professor Sargon, he refuses to lie though. And Pebbles asks, well, maybe your calculations were wrong. And Professor Sargon points to the apple kiss and says, my calculations were perfect, check for yourself. But all of a sudden, some of those moths that escaped 
from the netting earlier, how we're resting on the Applicus. And Sargon, he must have accidentally counted them and mistook them for real pieces in his calculation, so he realizes that his calculations were actually wrong, and the asteroid will probably miss them. Hours pass. The newscaster tells the people, the asteroid passed the Earth safely and the world did not end. However, he tells the people, any asteroid-related questions or violent displeasures should be directed to Professor Sargon over at the Science Cave. Life awkwardly returns back to normal as everyone realizes they acted like asses now that they all didn't die. Professor Sargon is duct taped up to the wall in his Science Cave and he's forced to hire his old research assistant he fired earlier back as long as he agrees to help him down from the wall. And life continues another day for the people of Bedrock. Issue 7, Another Day on Earth. The Flintstones and the Rebels are having some barbecue at a picnic. A purple alien comes down to Earth and says to Fred, Greetings friend, I was just passing by and I can't help but notice this planet has way more liquid than it needs. So I was wondering if you wouldn't mind parting with an ocean or two. In exchange, I'll give you some really lovely beads, top-notch beads. If I could just get your DNA stamp right here? Fred, a little confused, says, I don't think we're allowed to just sell you the ocean. The Great Gazoo, he comes walking by and he starts shooing the other alien away. Remember, Great Gazoo is here to help protect the human race from outside alien interference. So Gazoo says, you aren't trying to take advantage of these simpletons, are you? It's my job to protect this primitive species' natural evolution. The purple alien leaves disappointed. As he heads out, savage marauders come to attack the Flintstones, and Fred asks the Great Gazoo, Are you going to protect me from these marauders? And Gazoo tells them, Oh no, they are your natural evolution. So Fred and the others escape in their vehicles while the marauders run after them. Later on, at the Church of Gerald, the priest tells the people that he is appalled at their recent behavior. A woman in the crowd says, What does Gerald care how we behave so long as we worship him? And the priest says, How you treat each other is very important to Gerald. Trust me, you don't want to push him. The wicked will get what's coming to them. A guy in the crowd says, Really? Because it doesn't seem like it. The priest then decides to make some stuff up. He says, Look, I never told you this before, but after you die, there's this um, burning pit. And when you die, if you were a jerk or an ass, you get thrown into the fire. And a guy in the crowd says, for reals? And the priest answers, yeah, man. And you like burn for all eternity. Wilma listening to this says, well, I hope raiding our picnic was worth it, Greg. So the marauders who raided their picnic the other day are right here, right now in this church. And Wilma is calling them out. <laughs> the Great Gazoo is writing his first official report on Earth to send back to his home planet. Gazoo writes, The planet came to be dominated by a single species known as human beings, which is a disaster for everyone, even themselves. We see the priest. He is worrying about bills for the church. And then a young woman named Kathy walks in. She is blonde, very rich, snobby, upper class, and she has her two kids in tow with her, hunter and gatherer. The woman says to the priest, I've really done it this time, Reverend. I'm afraid Gerald is going to send me to the fiery pit for sure. And the priest asks, why, what did you do? And Kathy says, mm, I don't want to get into specifics. I just need to get right with Gerald before my 4 p.m. And the priest says, Okay, well, maybe you could do something positive to make up for whatever you did. And Kathy says, mm, I love that idea. And the priest says, well, you could do something nice for others. Maybe serve them coffee as they come into church. And Kathy re replies, ooh, that sounds awesome, Sauce. Thing is, I am mucho busy right now. Could I just maybe give you money and let you handle it for me? And the priest, not knowing what to say, replies, well, I, uh... And Kathy cuts in, thanks, you're a plum. And then she brings her two kids hunter-gatherer with her as she leaves. The priest kind of has a solution to his money problems now. He could just absolve people of their sins for cash. In the history of Christianity, the church at one point sold something called 
indulgences, where they would sell forgiveness of sins for a fee. Bereaved relatives could get a deceased loved one out of purgatory, for instance. Or at the right price, they could also save their own future sins. So this is what Russell is parodying here. We jump back over to Fred. There's a new co-worker down at the quarry. This new co-worker, he's not the best employee. We see him getting pushed off this animal by a pterodactyl, and Fred calls him a stupid newbie. Later on that day, though, that newbie, he's supposed to blow up some rocks, and Fred tells him, don't use the dynamite inside the quarry, it's too dangerous. But the newbie is cocky and says, thanks for the health tip, grandpa. Sure enough, the fuse explodes and causes a rock slide in the quarry, and the newbie gets buried under all these rocks. Fred, concerned, yells, man down. Fred and the crew start carefully removing the rocks and trying to save this newbie's life if he is alive. He may be dead, though. Mr. Slate runs over and asks, what are they all doing? Why have they stopped working? And Fred explains about the cave-in, and they are trying to save this man, or maybe at least recover his body, so they have to be careful and remove the rubble. And Mr. Slate says that he's got an order due on Friday. Shame about what happened to this new guy, but life goes on. I get your concerns, Flintstone. I really do, but maybe we should just focus our grief on filling that order. You know, I think Newbie would have wanted it that way. And Fred in anger says, you didn't even know his name. The rest of the workers think Mr. Slate is being a jerk in this situation, not caring about the life of his employee. Now Fred, he goes home for the night, and he's really sad about the day's events, and potentially losing the life of one of his co-workers. Back to the priest. Tons of people are showing up to his door, and they say, We heard you're taking money to absolve people of their sins, is that true? And they're all lining up to give him money. Great Gazoo continues writing his report. He writes, Survival has become easy for them, and life boring. They do their best to fill the void left by the struggle for survival, but nothing satisfies them for long, so they just keep going back for more. Strangely, it's when you give people what they don't really want that they can never really get enough of it. Back at the church, the reverend embracing this new monetary system of absolving sins says, By the way, absolution for gluttony now costs 10 gravel. Please consult the new price menu. After the service, Mr. Slate comes in to talk with the Reverend, and Slate talks about the man in the quarry that is trapped under all the rubble, and how he's going to have to shut down the quarry to dig for him. Slate says, I know it's wrong, and I know it's not what Gerald would have me do, but Permy wants to just shut down the rescue effort so we can get back to business. And what I want to know is, I guess, how much is this going to cost me? So Mr. Slate, he just wants to pay Gerald to be absolved of the sin of not searching for this guy and keeping the business running as usual. Now, the priest, Reverend Tom, he is sickened by this and he realizes that taking money to absolve people of their sins is not the right way to do things. The next day, more people are arriving from the town to get their sins absolved. And one man says, can I talk you down to 20? I barely kicked him. And another woman says, Oh, I used to waste so much time praying and doing nice things. I love how efficient our religion has become. The reverend says he can't take it anymore, and he tells everyone he will no longer be accepting cash as payment for forgiveness of sins. The sin industrial complex is over. Later on, nighttime at the quarry, Fred and the others are removing stones, trying to rescue that lost worker. Mr. Slate tells them, the quarry is losing money by the day and he orders them to stop this rescue operation. Fred apologizes but says he won't abandon this guy. And Mr. Slate asks Fred, why do you even care? It's not like he was your family, he wasn't even your friend. And Fred answers, because. If civilization is going to last, if it's going to amount to anything more than just a place to watch TV and get cheap snake meat, it will only be because we've learned to do one thing. And Mr. Slate says, and what's that? And Fred answers, to take care of people who mean nothing to us. And Mr. Slate groans and says, whatever, I'm going home. One of the workers tells Fred, they've cleared the trench to the bottom of the pit, but they can't move any more rocks, it's too dangerous, they could all cave in. And Fred says that the guy is still trapped under there, he's trapped under all that rock, you're gonna have to lower me down. And the other worker tells Fred, it's too dangerous, 
but Fred doesn't care. He says, get the Bronto crane ready. We see this Brontosaurus starts lowering Fred on a rope down into the rock. Great Kazoo, he continues writing about the human race and civilization, and he writes, I think I know where this species went wrong. Human beings were never meant to be the top of the food chain. Their fears and anxieties served them well when they were prey, but natural predators are confident and lazy. They only kill as much as they need to survive. It's only the nervous, wide-eyed scavenger who's always on the lookout for more. Their voracious appetites were cute when they didn't know where their next meal was coming from, but now that they run the world, they devour everything in sight and nothing can stop them. They self-destruct almost as if they know they don't belong at the top of the food chain. They use fear to fuel their greed and greed to justify their fear. This species will probably prove to be a one-off, an embarrassing asterisk in the history of an otherwise promising planet. I would put the betting odds against the human race at 25 to 1. But then again, maybe I'm missing something. We see Fred down in the rocks, saving that newbie employee, saving a man he barely knew, a man who actually insulted and didn't listen to him earlier and got himself into this mess. But Fred risked his own life to save this man because it was the right thing to do. And it is the only way civilization will survive if we all look out for each other. Issue 8, The Leisure Class. This issue has commentary on the rich, economics, sexism, women's place in society, and military funding. The issue opens on a flashback 30 years ago, back to when Wilma was a child, back to the hunter-gatherer days. The men returned from hunting wild animals and returned with a tiny boar, but they seemed self-satisfied. Meanwhile, Wilma's mother and the other woman collected fruit, but Wilma's mother came up with the idea to plant seeds along their migration route, and she theorized that next year fruit will have grown there waiting for them. Thrak, who seems to be the leader of this group, he says to Wilma's mom, Whatever you say, gorgeous. Hey, be a good girl and clean up this boar, won't you? Then at dinner, Thrak says to his fellow hunters, Another awesome feast, bros, to the bringers of meat. And he gives a toast. We jump back to the current day, to the airport. Wilma and Betty are gonna go visit Wilma's mom for a week by plane. She lives on something called a farm. Once the girls head on the plane, Barney comments to Fred that he doesn't know if he can last a whole week without Betty. She does so much for him. The next morning, Bam Bam and Barney are sitting around the table and it's breakfast time and Bam Bam is asking his dad if he's gonna make some food. Barney doesn't really know what to do, so he just offers Bam Bam some Cheetos, and Bam Bam is not impressed. Later on at school, the teacher introduces her class to a guest speaker, a Mr. Thornstone Peblin. He is going to teach the kids about a new field of research called economics. Peblin explains, when you trick somebody into participating in a small time fraud, it's called a scam. We see an image of someone playing three-card Monty with shells to illustrate this. Peblin continues. But when the scam is so big that people have no choice but to participate, it's called economics. This is illustrated by Fred complaining about a rent increase after just getting a raise. And Fred's landlord says, yep, that's why your rent's going up. Peblin continues. Thanks to civilization and its division of labor, we now create more crap than anyone knows what to do with. And the more crap civilization makes, the more we buy. The more we buy, the bigger civilization gets, allowing it to still create even more crap. In other words, civilization grows like a cancer. Anyone here know someone with cancer? The teacher then shuts the economics guest speaker down saying, okay, I think that's all the time we have for economics today. We see Claude the Destroyer, now mayor, is talking to his son who is just a normal skinny bureaucrat. Claude says, now that Claude is mayor, I destroy lizard people. And his son the bureaucrat says, uh, not so fast big guy, our army's dinosaur armor is badly out of date. And Claude says, well I shall buy more. And the bureaucrat explains that Claude is already over budget. Claude pointing to the children's hospital says, so puny baby gets all money he needs but claude is over budget but claude is mayor claude take money from baby the bureaucrat explains any change to the budget requires a majority vote of the townspeople and you have a real problem with the woman voters 
Claude is really disappointed with all of this. The bureaucrat tells him, why don't we get some famous celebrities to endorse you and then everyone will get behind you. So the first celebrity endorsement of Claude is Stony Danza, a clear parody of Tony Danza, star of 80s sitcom Who's the Boss? Stony Danza says in a TV commercial, Hi, I'm Stony Danza, and I'd like to talk to you about lizard people. Lizard people aren't like me and you. They don't love freedom. They don't love their children. I'm not even sure they have children. Just look at them. They're weird. I don't know much about lizard people, but I do know this. They are a threat to you and everything you hold dear. That's why I'm asking you to support Claude the Destroyer's budget proposal. Who's the boss? Claude is. Stony Danza is then standing beside Claude and they're both smiling. Of all the random celebrities Mark Russell could have chose for this bit, I think Tony Danza is obscure enough that it, it merely made me laugh here. <laughs> uh, Wilma and Betty land and they go over to see Wilma's mom at the farm. Wilma asks her mom, how's farm life? And the mom answers, it's okay, I guess. A lot of bending over in dirt, you know. And Wilma asks her mom, why do we ever give up being hunter-gatherers to live on a farm? Now we have another flashback to those hunter-gatherer days. Wilma's mom explains, their idea to plant the seeds worked, but it made them just stay in one place, and that really changed everything about their lives. Having a place to call home and all that extra food, it didn't really make their lives better, it just made more people. And more children meant women were forced to stay at home and care for them, and more of the men were left in charge. Now we see two men, Brack and Jethro, working out a trade. Corn and goats. They're trying to trade corn for goats. Thrak wants the goats, but Jethro says he's not interested in corn, but he could use a new wife, pointing to a young Wilma at that time. So Thrak happily trades Wilma for some goats. Wilma's mom was not happy about this situation. Back to the current day at the Flintstones house. Fred is struggling to get by without Wilma. Fred asks Pebbles help in loading the dishwasher. He says, the dishwasher doesn't seem to like me. You see the octopus dishwasher shake a rolling pin at Fred. Back at school, the economist was kicked out of the class, but he pokes his head through the window and tells the kid more about economics. He says, you'd think the more crap a society produces, the less work it needs from everyone, but rather than lightening everyone's load, it just enables some people not to work at all. These lucky souls are known as the leisure class. An example of this, we see Mr. Slate playing golf on the golf course, enjoying his spot in the leisure class. The economist, he continues, the hardest working and most creative people contribute the most to human survival. Now, an example of this, we see Wilma's mom and Wilma working the farm. The economist continues narrating, and yet because we all aspire to be in the leisure class, we value the people who destroy the most and work the least. To symbolize this, we see Claude the Destroyer and Stony Danza. The economist then concludes by saying, the paradox of our economic system has placed us at odds with our own survival. We are locked in a state of moral confusion. The teacher then shoes and whacks the economist away once again. Back to Wilma and her mom. Wilma asks her mom, are we not even going to talk about this? The fact that I ran away from home? And Wilma's mom says, The day that Thrak promised you to Jethro, I knew you had to leave. And Wilma asks her mom, crying, I was too young to have to make that decision. Do you have any idea what that's like to be left alone in the world? To feel abandoned by your own mother? And Wilma's mom says, The night that you ran away broke my heart. I wanted to stop you and tell you that Thrak had no right to marry you off, but... He had already accepted the goats as your bridal price. I knew he would never let you leave after that. At some point, without knowing it, I had become a farm animal myself, and I didn't want that life for you. I let you leave because I couldn't say anything. I could never say anything. Wilma comforts her mom, saying that she never knew her mom felt that way. So in a very serious kind of story mixed in with the Flintstones here, is a commentary about how back in the day throughout history, the men were often solely in charge and the women did as they were told and they could be traded away for something as insignificant as a goat. 
Stony Danza is on TV once again, trying to convince people to vote for this dinosaur armor. He says, Some of you are still not sure if we should take money away from the children's hospital to pay for new dinosaur armor, especially when there are so many sick children in Bedrock. But the truth is, kids are pretty much always sick, and we spend millions on children's health, and yet they just keep getting sick. Meanwhile, lizard people run amok, laughing at us from their hot, flat rocks. They laugh at you, me, and little Smitty here. Now, Smitty isn't conscious, but if he were, I'm sure there's one thing he'd want to say to you. He'd say, please support Claude the Destroyer's defense budget reallocation. Now, the bureaucrat tells Claude, women's voters still won't like you for closing the children's hospital. Claude is beside himself, and he says, what? Even after impassioned plea by Stony Danza? The bureaucrat tells Claude, well, he was popular like 20 years ago. He's not the best celebrity. And Claude says, Stony Danza was the best he could get. And the bureaucrat tells Claude, look, don't worry. There's a town hall. As long as you keep the men on your side, it will pass. We jump back to the classroom. The economist, not taking no for an answer, he pops out of the ceiling in the class and continues explaining away economics. He says, it's not that the leisure class is lazy. They just feel too important for boring work society actually needs. They feel driven to conquer, to recreate the world as a monument to themselves, whatever the cost to the rest of us. In the hunter-gatherer days, even though the gatherers provided way more food for the tribe, it was the hunt that was celebrated. It was the strongest hunter we trusted to rule the tribe, whether or not he was actually fit to lead. Now we see Claude picking out the new dinosaur armor. He asks if there is a cup holder, so this is an example of the strong leading even though they're not fit to lead. The economist continues, in a way, you could say that men were the world's first leisure class. Pebbles replies to this, Somehow this makes sense of everything. So this is an interesting commentary. How with Claude the Destroyer, clearly he is not a good leader. He is a dumb oaf, but he is strong and projects power. So people look to him as a leader, even though his policies are terrible. We can see examples of this in history and today of strong men and dictators all around the world. Probably not the best leaders, not having the best interest of the people in their minds, only interested in their own self-interest. Yet, these people often are the ones that rule us. Also, the way that Claude the Destroyer is pushing for this dinosaur armor and closing down the children's hospital can be seen as a commentary on the military industrial complex we have in today's society and America's obsession with war and military spending and their often cheapness when it comes to funding healthcare for their own citizens. It is now time for the town hall. The women are furious about Claude the Destroyer's proposal about closing down this children's hospital. And Claude yells, Silence, woman! Fred then raises his hand to talk, and he explains about how he fought in the Bedrock Wars, a misguided war he fought in because he thought he had to in order to keep his wife and daughter safe. But the truth is, there are really only two things survival really requires of men. Impregnating women and protecting children. When it comes to impregnating women, men have really done their jobs admirably. But when it comes to protecting children, we have failed miserably. For this point, we see an image of a young Wilma running away from home, not wanting to be promised to another man for some goats. Fred ends by saying, So as a man, why would we turn our backs on one of only two things that makes us biologically relevant? I think the answer must be that we are a species that doesn't take its survival very seriously. So Fred is really arguing against closing down this children's hospital and going into some frivolous war with these lizard people. The men in the crowd ponder Fred's thoughtful statement. Then they proceed to vote and the measure passes and the new dinosaur armor wins. The bureaucrat says, great, measure passes. Now let's go kill us some lizard people. So Fred's impassioned words had no effect. Later on, as Fred, Barney, and the rest are driving home, Barney does comment, I have to admit, that new dinosaur armor does look pretty sweet. Wilma and Betty arrive home from their trip, and Fred and Barney hug their wives, and Pebbles says to her mom, never leave me alone again, mom. And Wilma says to her daughter, 
Pebbles, no matter where you are or how long it's been, as long as you have a mother, you're never truly alone. You see an image of Wilma's mother hanging up her daughter's artwork. Wilma's mom loves her daughter just as much as Wilma loves Pebbles. Issue 9, A Basket of Disposables. The priest of Gerald is worried that attendance is down at church. We see the reason for this is that a new religion has sprung up, one where they worship a snake in a tie called Vorp. The priest of Vorp explains that Vorp asks nothing of you but that you take your rightful place as rulers of this world. This religion appeals to the elite. We see Rockstone, the TV anchorman, Mr. Slate, and Kathy, that blonde, snobby, rich woman we met recently, and Claude the Destroyer. They are all worshipping this Vorp. Mr. Slate, down at the quarry, now inspired by his new worshipping of this Vorp, announces that everyone is fired. He is bringing in some Neanderthal and Gorilla replacements that he can pay half as much. One week later, Fred is depressed on the couch watching TV, bummed about being unemployed. Rockstone on the TV announces that Slate Enterprises has posted record profits thanks to recent layoffs. Wilma sees her husband depressed and wants to make him feel better, so she buys him a brand new bowling ball. This one has his name painted on it. Fred thanks his wife, and Wilma takes the old bowling ball and throws it into the recycling bin. Later on, Elephant Vacuum Cleaner sees his friend Armadillo Bowling Ball being hauled away in the recycling car, and he says no! He is sad about this. Later that night, he tries to get along with the new bowling ball, and he asks, Excuse me, could you let me out of the closet? I'm afraid of the dark. And new bowling ball says to him, Shut up! And Elephant replies, Oh, okay. We see Mr. Slate. He is now dating Kathy, that rich, snobby blonde woman, and they are having a carriage ride being pulled by a triceratops. The two of them love their new religion, worshipping this Vorp. Kathy comments, Finally, a god for the upwardly mobile. Gerald was such a squish. Kathy and Mr. Slate kiss. They seem really into each other, but their main thing they have in common is that they are rich and they want to only date among their own financial class. Kathy comments, Oh look, poor people, as they ride by some homeless war vets lying on the ground. Mr. Slate, he is back home. He is talking to his turtle butler, Philip. Mr. Slate explains that he is in a new relationship with this Kathy woman that he loves, and she wants to date a titan, a man who can handle any situation, and he needs to start surrounding himself with people who make him look good. So Slate tells Philip that they've had some good times, but Philip is just too old and slow, and he's a turtle, and Mr. Slate is going to have to let Philip go. Mr. Slate then brings in his new servant, a hawk named Brutus. Mr. Slate removes the hood on the hawk and tells Brutus to fetch him his mail, and Brutus does so very quick. Slate then tells Brutus to grab a cigar, and then grab one for yourself as well. And the two of them smoke cigars. Mr. Slate comments, My new life begins now. Back at the Flintstones' house, everyone is trying to cheer Fred up, and they want to take him bowling with his new ball as a way to ease his depression. As all the humans leave, Elephant and the rest of the appliances get to talking. Elephant says that they have to save their friend, Bowling Ball. Birdlamp says, Appliance, you crazy! We don't even know where they took him! And Elephant says that he has a pretty good idea. Dino comes in the room to talk to the rest of the appliances, but the rest of the appliances don't trust him. Elephant tells Dino they are sorry about this, but they are on a top secret mission. The appliances make their way across town, down to the recycling center. Snake manages to get them through the locked door. They then search around and find Bowling Ball locked up in a cage. They free him, and as they are leaving, Moose Coat Rack sees some rejected animal appliances and says, Coat Rack, don't play that. And the animal appliances free all the trapped animals and they all run free. We see Mr. Slate with his new hawk, Brutus. Slate goes over to Kathy's house, and Kathy is surprised to see him. Kathy breaks the news to George that she is seeing someone else now. We see she is in a relationship with Claude the Destroyer. And Mr. Slate asks, what? So that time we spent together meant nothing to you? And Kathy says, 
Oh, it's not personal. He's just simply richer and more powerful. What can I say? I traded up. And Claw the Destroyer waves. Mr. Slate tells his hawk Brutus to attack Claw. Brutus flies at Claude, but instead of attacking Claude the Destroyer, the hawk just perches himself on Claude's arm and is going to stay with Claude now. <laughs> and Mr. Slate, betrayed by his hawk, says, What? You too, Brutus? Which is a Shakespeare reference in the play Julius Caesar at the moment of Caesar's assassination to his supposed friend Marcus Brutus. Caesar's last words were, You too, Brutus? Fred and the others return home. Wilma places the new bowling ball down on the floor, and later on that night, Elephant and the other appliances take new bowling ball out for a walk, and they tell him, good luck with your future endeavors, as they kick him out of the house and send him off. Elephant comments to the other appliances, eh, they'll find him in the morning, I'm sure he'll be okay. But just then a hawk flies down and takes away new bowling ball, probably due to his death. <laughs> Uh, old Bowling Ball is back home, and the other animals have painted the name Fred on his back, just like the new Bowling Ball had, so no one will be the wiser. The next morning, Mr. Slate has a change of heart since his recent breakup with Kathy, and he shows up personally to Fred Flintstone's house to give Fred his job back. Fred is happy he has a job again, and Wilma comments, Now everything can go back. To normal. Although we see Dino apparently is still tied up in the pantry and the other appliances put him there so he wouldn't ruin their plans to save Bowling Ball. Issue 10, Buyer's Remorse. This issue covers some commentary on cinema, death, politics, and war. Newscaster Rockstone is telling everyone about a new thing called cinema. The ability to record and project technicolor images is all the craze in Bedrock. And now everyone is going to the movies. Esteemed director Werner Herzog, spoof of a German director Werner Herzog, he explains, Cinema is a visual exploration of our common humanity. It is the microscope through which we look for our own souls. Rockstone continues, Of course, with any new technology, the question in the back of everyone's mind is, Can I have sex with it or use it to kill people? Rockstone then goes out into the field and interviews a man on the street, another victim of the lizard people. The man says, They stole my ferns! So tensions between the people of Bedrock and the lizard people is continuing to slowly escalate, and Claude the Destroyer is promising swift and decisive action. Now the people of Bedrock, they don't really know much about these lizard people, but they fear them. Even though the only thing the lizard people have really directly done to them so far is steal their ferns. The war is now beginning and Claw the Destroyer leads his army to the lizard people. We see these pretty sweet visuals of the dinosaurs in all their new dinosaur armor. Claude and his army arrive to the rocks where the lizard people usually lie on, but all the lizard people appear to be gone. Claude's assistant says, it looks like they left, that they probably heard us coming from a mile away and ran. Claude did not anticipate this and is disappointed that they couldn't bash any lizard people's brains in today. Fred and Barney are talking on the phone and Barney tells Fred there's a new movie he thinks both of them should see now that cinema is a thing of course. And Fred asks, well what's the movie about? And Barney whispers, it's about women bearing themselves. <laughs> And Fred replies, I'm a married man, Barney. You are too. And Barney replies to this, I know, but it's just watching. Aren't you ever curious about, you know, other women, what they're like? And Fred admits, yes. And Barney says, good, I'll meet you there later. So they're going to go to the cinema. The big draw is, of course, the chance of seeing some topless women. Now, when they arrive at the cinema, the movie they go to see is called Shale Magnolia's perhaps a play on the movie Steel Magnolias. Uh, I don't know how much topless women there is going to be in there. And when they said that it's about women burying themselves, perhaps they just meant emotionally. But Fred and Barney, they walk into the cinema with trench coats, not wanting to be seen. We jump over to Wilma. She goes to a local art gallery where she submitted some art pieces of hers weeks ago. She asks the people there if they had time to review her art and they brush her off because she's a woman and they did not take her art seriously. Later on, esteemed director Werner Herzrock 
he enters that same art gallery, he's looking around, he's trying to find a new art director for his latest film. He's looking at the artwork in the gallery and is terribly unimpressed. As he leaves, he notices this dumpster where Wilma's submitted paintings were tossed out, and Werner Herzrock really likes these paintings and he wishes to speak to the artist about a potential job opportunity. On the news, we see Rockstone reporting that there has been setbacks in the war with the lizard people. Meanwhile, the mundane tasks of governing go undone and voters aren't happy. One voter who's a Claude fan says, You know, I didn't realize how little time a mayor actually spends kicking ass. Mayor Claude, he vows to win back his supporters though by upping his efforts in the war with the lizard people. We see Claude has done this by sending in pterodactyl drones. Now Werner Herzrock, he heads over to the Flintstone house and speaks with Wilma. He wants her to be his new art director on his latest film, and Wilma accepts. We jump over to Fred and Barney, they are at the Veterans Hall. They are talking about how good that movie they saw was, and they talk to one of their friends into joining them going to the cinema again. This time they see a brand new film called Bridges of Mattistone County, play on the movie Bridges of Madison County. Claude and his advisor are talking. Claude feels bad for closing the children's hospital now that the war isn't going so great. His advisor says that they need more money now, the pterodactyl drones were expensive. And at the next town hall where they're talking about the budget, Claude explains that he has unleashed the pterodactyl drones to find and destroy the lizard people and the lizard people will pay for every fern that they have stolen. But in order to pay for this war and the pterodactyl drones, he's had to get a little creative with the budget. So how did Claude get creative with the budget? Well, we see Fred is concerned because he's found out that they've replaced his retirement money with coupons for this restaurant called Tarby's, a ripoff of Arby's. So his retirement has been replaced with coupons to a restaurant. At the Flintstones house, the appliances are wondering where Elephant Vacuum Cleaner is. Apparently, Elephant Vacuum Cleaner snuck away from the Flintstones house and went to the cinema himself. And he went to see a movie called The Joy Rock Club, parody of The Joy Luck Club. Vacuum Cleaner, he loved the movie. And as he is leaving the theater room, he says, This was the best night ever. Now the cinema manager is yelling at one of his employees that the floor is filthy and he tells the employee, grab that vacuum cleaner right there and clean the floor in the cinema. So the employee grabs Elephant Vacuum Cleaner and begins cleaning the cinema floor. And Elephant Vacuum Cleaner says, no, not a movie theater floor or anything but that. The movie theater floor is so dirty that Elephant Vacuum Cleaner gets slightly sick from it. Later on, we see Wilma working on that Werner Herzrock's movie set, helping out. She isn't that confident in her abilities, but Werner shares some inspirational words. Now, one of the actors on the set that's in a zebra costume explains to Werner, I can't see anything in the zebra costume. And Werner Herzrock answers back, The only true obstacle is mortality, Peter. Anyway, after some time passes, Wilma is getting better and better at her job and is getting pretty good at building a good set. Meanwhile, the pterodactyl drones accidentally start killing innocent civilians and picnickers, and they've not successfully killed any lizard people. The townspeople of Bedrock are not happy with this development in the war. They complain to Claude the Destroyer at the town hall about all the innocent deaths and that this war is costing them millions. But Claude says he has a plan. But when pressed on that plan, Claude says, Claude's plan will work through work and planning. But the townspeople call Claude out and say, he's got nothing. Claude tries to sway them and says, how many ferns have the lizard people stolen? Lizard people are Bedrock's enemies and war costs money. This is why Claude closed hospital and cut spending. Now Fred interrupts and tells the townspeople, yeah, the lizard people stole some ferns, but every day we do worse stuff to each other right here in Bedrock. The truth is, we're just weirded out by the lizard people. We see in this imagery here that the lizard people appear to be using the ferns in some sort of weird dance ritual. Fred continues, 
Now, just because we're weirded out by the lizard people, we turn our back on sick children and trade our retirement away for loose meat sandwiches? We take money out of our schools and make life harder for ourselves. And for what? To kill a few lizard people? And the other townspeople chime in. My daughter is sick and I want my retirement back. And another guy says, You know, I never thought I'd say this in a million years, but screw my ferns. Later on, Elephant Vacuum Cleaner managed to make his way home, but he ended up dying. He vacuumed so much disgusting stuff off that movie theater floor, he got sick and passed away. Now, his friend, Armadillo Bowling Ball, says, No, what? Armadillo and all the other appliances are sad to hear about their friend's death. Later that night, they have a eulogy for their lost friend, Elephant Vacuum Cleaner. And Bowling Ball says, Death, like life, finds meaning in our connections to each other. Grief is bearable only because it can be shared. And in the end, everything in our lives worth having is the product of others. You never know the first time you meet somebody that they will be a friend, somebody who will change your life. But looking back, no one can deny how much vacuum cleaner meant to us. He made us better animals. Wilma, she has to throw out vacuum cleaner, a little upset, but Fred tells her, don't be upset, honey, it was just a thing. Now, Claw the Destroyer is in bed. He is upset and doesn't want to go outside and face the angry townspeople mob. The angry mob is outside yelling, F my ferns, F my ferns. They don't really care about their ferns when they think, really think about it. Now, Claude's assistant tells Claude, um, stay in bed, I'll fix this. So the townspeople, they want to get rid of Claude, but the assistant doesn't know what to do. He says, Claude has abandoned reality. And the assistant admits that he played a small role in this debacle himself, and he wants to fix it, but there won't be another election for four years, so he doesn't really know what they can all do. Wilma has an idea, though. We see the next day, they have put Wilma's plan into action. Claude's assistant tells Claude that they have moved the mayor's office, and they show Claude his new mayor's office, and Claude says, oh, I think this phone isn't connected to anything. And the assistant responds, oh, uh, just speak into that bowl of fruit and I'll hear everything you have to say. It's state-of-the-art technology. Well, gotta go. So Claude has been set up on that movie set that Wilma was helping design. And the townspeople are tricking Claude into thinking that he is still in charge. But really, they just have sequestered him away in this dummy office where he can waste the next four years. Claude's assistant then puts the previous mayor back in charge. Although technically, Claude will still be the mayor and the previous mayor is just comptroller. But from here on out, the comptroller here will call the shots. And the previous mayor, who's now comptroller, asks, aren't you afraid Claude will realize he's not living in the real world and not in charge anymore? And the assistant says, he's not worried. Now we see Claude talking to an orange and he says, Okay, Orange, what if we put giant magnifying glass over the lizard people? So, Claude, he's going to be able to keep himself busy. So, although Claude is still technically mayor, this is basically the end of his reign. Issue 11, the Neighborhood Association. It's Fred's birthday coming up, and Barney tells Betty that he got Fred a really good gift. Now, Barney notices a new vegan restaurant has just opened up called Exquisite Crops. Now, with vegan restaurants come, of course, hipsters. A new hipster named Chip moved in next door to the Rubbles, and he knocks on the door and introduces himself to Barney and Barney's family. Now, Chip, the hipster, asks if Barney has seen his micro pig around, and Barney says no, but clearly the saber-toothed tiger pet outside just ate that pig. Now, the hipster and the rubbles begin to chat. Chip the hipster asks if they have any kombucha, which of course they do not. Chip says he used to live in these shale condos, but he found it so safe and boring. He likes it more here in this neighborhood because it's real and gritty. Betty doesn't love the use of the word gritty to describe her home. We see the great gazoo is walking around Bedrock. He has been called back home. He doesn't know why. 
but thinks that it can't be good. Great Gazoo is worried about leaving the humans, thinking that they need all the help they can get. We see a human here has an 8 ball stuck in his mouth, and he can't get it out. He tried to put it in his mouth on some sort of bet. So clearly the human race isn't the sharpest. So it's Fred's birthday and everyone is giving Fred their gifts. And Betty got Fred a thigh master. Pebbles gives her dad a music record she really likes and thinks he would dig. Barney, excited to give Fred his gift, tells Fred to look outside. Barney spent six months making a gigantic statue of the two of them. Barney calls it Friends Forever. I don't think Fred is in love with it, but he's going to pretend he likes it. The Great Gazoo has left Earth and returned to his home planet of Las Vega. His home planet appears to be some sort of Las Vegas ripoff. Obsessed with gambling and betting on the odds of survival of various species and planets. So Gazoo is talking to his alien boss. And the boss tells Gazoo that he has been doing good work in his reports, but... The boss wants a group called the Neighborhood Association to decide whether the people of Earth are appropriate for their galaxy or not. And he wants Gazoo to be this Neighborhood Association's guide. So later on, Gazoo is flying around with this Neighborhood Association. And the Neighborhood Association, they're flying in space and they see a dome city on this planet Omega Prime. And they hate the look of it and think it looks disgusting and tacky. So they blow up the entire planet, killing everyone. And Gazoo is shocked and says, So you guys go around destroying planets and killing people? And the Neighborhood Association replies, Pretty much. At Fred's house, more hipsters are moving into the neighborhood. They are worried about their property values though and ask Fred if he would take down that statue that they just put up. Fred, he really wants to take the statue down, but he doesn't want to hurt Barney's feelings, so he's not going to take it down. We see Great Gazoo in space. He doesn't like that this neighbor association just blew up this planet. And the leader of that association explains that before them, there was space junk everywhere, interstellar wars, chaos, and they showed mercy once to this species called the Green Man Group, and they almost overran the galaxy. There were like weeds popping up everywhere. And Gazoo argues, look, I get that. We, we don't want to be overrun, but to kill people before they've actually done anything? The ethics of that, I don't. But the neighborhood association leader argues back, ethics? Pfft. You either snuff out a threat when it's small or let it grow big enough to kill you. Ethics are just the choice between being an asshole or a sucker. Besides, we aren't about just exploding planets. We also have a very nice newsletter we put out, and we give gift baskets too. The Neighborhood Association leader then turns his attention to his navigator and tells him to resume the course for Earth, and ready the gift baskets and the death cannon. At Fred's house, his landlord comes to visit him. With all the hipsters moving in, property values are going up, and the landlord explains he has to raise Fred's rent a little. Fred says that's not fair, but the landlord explains, Look, this neighborhood is hot right now. I can either raise your rent a little or sell your house for a lot. I'm actually doing you a favor here. Back in space, the neighborhood association leader explains that they have to abduct an earthling, conduct a brain scan on that earthling, and see what makes them tick. If everything checks out, we welcome them to the neighborhood association. But if they are unfriendly, too warlike, too smart for us, or threaten us in any way, we'll exterminate them. Gazoo thinks this is terrible, and he's afraid that for sure they're gonna not like the Earthlings and want to kill them all. The Neighborhood Association leader says, sorry, but thumbs the rules, gotta keep the galaxy safe and predictable. So Gazoo asks, can I at least pick the Earthling that you scan? And he's told, sure, it doesn't matter. The test will work on any member of the species. Back at Fred's house, his new hipster neighbors ask him once again to remove the statue. They've asked nicely, but now it's come time for action. The hipsters have signed a petition. And Fred, confused, asks, what's a petition? And the hipster explains, I don't know, it's sort of like us asking again, but this time we all signed it. <laughs> and Fred explains that he can't get rid of the statue. It was a gift from his best friend, and he just can't say no to Barney's face. He says pointing to Barney in the window across to the other house, and Fred says that the statue stays. 
the hipsters retreat, saying, This isn't over. Everyone, to the co-op! Great Gazoo and the Neighborhood Association are now hovering above Earth and are going to begin their scan on an individual. Gazoo has chosen someone to be scanned. We're led to believe here that it's going to be Fred. So the aliens, they scan this individual, and the results begin tabulating. We see back down on Earth, the hipsters invite Fred over, and are fine with the statue now, as they have erected a huge fence around Fred's property, hiding it. Fred sees Barney even hanging up some of that fence too. And Fred asks Barney, you don't like seeing the statue either? And Barney admits, eh, it sort of got old after a while. Besides, let's face it Fred, that thing is hideous. So even Barney's not into the statue anymore. So I think it's okay for Fred to take down that statue. The aliens have the result of their scan. And the neighborhood association leader reads the results and says, well, here are the results. Wow, no aggressive or warlike tendencies whatsoever. Extremely friendly and far below average intelligence. They are the perfect candidate for the neighborhood association. And he turns to Great Gazoo and says, and you were worried. They also apparently have a real thing for meat. But anyway, this is one of the best scores we've ever seen. Let's meet this Earth person. And in runs Dino, Fred's dog. And he is barking and runs to the computer monitor, which has the image of meat on it. And it becomes clear that Great Gazoo has tricked the neighborhood association. They told Gazoo he could pick any Earthling and it wouldn't matter. And Gazoo, rather than pick a human, picked Dino the dog, which of course is very different than a normal human. So the neighborhood association bought it. They're going to allow Earth into their group and Gazoo just saved the Earth. Great Gazoo, he returns down to the planet and returns Dino the dog back to Fred. And the human race gets to live another day. Issue 12, Farewell to Bedrock. So Great Gazoo is writing his final report. He writes, Why did I save the human race? It wasn't that long ago that this species was young, powerless, vulnerable. I guess everyone is cute when they're a baby, but... They are not cute anymore now that they are running the place. Their institutions seem preoccupied with trivia, content to ignore questions central to their species' survival. This does not improve their odds. They seem to be making it up as they go along. We see at church, the priest says, Gerald made the first man out of mud. That's why we need to shower every day. And Pebbles asks, well, what about the first woman? And the priest answers, um... Gerald made her out of an extra rib or something. If you know the Adam and Eve origin story in Christianity, this is essentially how supposedly God made the earth. And it's clear that it's just some guy making it up as he's going along. Great Gazoo continues writing, My theory is that the human race has entered its terrible twos. They still act like they're babies, and babies are basically sociopaths, which is okay because babies need to be greedy and selfish and self-absorbed in order to survive. But at some point, babies grow into children, children with the strength to break their own toys, to destroy the planet that has been their nursery, their playground. Whether or not this species will survive depends whether they grow up enough to realize their destructive power or continue reveling in their babyhood until all their toys are broken. Rockstone on the news says, and now some vaguely informative stories. He explains that the children's hospital has been reopened courtesy of the new mayor, or rather, comptroller. Even George Slate has added a new addition to the children's hospital. We see he has opened Slate's home for subpar children. <laughs> Slate admits he's not the best at naming. Fred and his bowling team, known as the Quarry Men, are in the championship bowling game against an all-female bowling team known as the Spare Ribs. This match is going down the next day. Mr. Slate tells Fred that he wants to win that game tomorrow badly. His ex-girlfriend Kathy is on the other team, and he really wants to defeat her. Mr. Slate tells Fred if Fred wins the game for him, he'll give Fred that foreman job he's always wanted. Fred says, consider it done. Pebbles and Bam Bam, they're biking over to the science cave for their group called Young Scientists, where they learn about the world. Pebbles is talking to Bam Bam on the way and says, Do you ever think that maybe Reverend Tom doesn't know what he's talking about? 
Doesn't it make you feel weird sitting in church, listening to how everything is the work of Gerald, and then going to the science cave and figuring out how the world actually works? Shouldn't we have to choose between Gerald and science? And Bam Bam responds, I don't know. Not necessarily. I mean, maybe we just figured Gerald should be able to play by his own rules. At the Flintstones house, all the appliances are worried about Armadillo Bowling Ball and think that he is acting up. Bowling Ball is upset still about the loss of his friend Elephant, and he hates living with the humans, and Fred always throwing him around at the bowling alley. He's not very happy. Back at the science cave, Pebbles says to Professor Sargon, At church, they told us that human beings were created out of mud. And the professor answers back, Ha! <laughs> not likely. Given how much we resemble other primates, we almost certainly descend from a common ancestor. I wrote a book about it. I was gonna call it The Origin of Species, or something like that. By the way, Origin of Species, that was the name of Charles Darwin's book on evolution. But Professor Sargon continues, But instead, I came up with this sweet title. <laughs> and the title of the book we see him holding up here is Chimpin' Ain't Easy. Pebbles asks, But how can you know for sure that we come from apes? Aren't you just guessing as well? And the professor says, Oh, you bet I am. But if I find evidence that shows I'm wrong, I'll just make a better guess next time. The world is exactly as it appears if only you look hard enough. And in the end, that's all science is, the act of looking harder. Rock Stone is commenting at the bowling alley for the bowling championship. He announces that the winning team gets a small trophy and a year's supply of pet food called Meaty Thumbs, the only pet food made entirely of the thumbs of convicts. The bowling tournament kicks off. Kathy tells Claude the Destroyer to hold her purse as she bowls a perfect strike. The tournament continues. Mr. Slate is not bowling that well, but Fred is keeping his team competitive with his various strikes. Near the end of the bowling match, it's all down to the final round for Fred. Fred's team is only down by three points, so it's all on him. Mr. Slate tells Fred to fulfill your destiny. Fred is trying to get that promotion he always wanted, and all he has to do is knock down a few pins and he will get what he wants. Fred, he grabs Armadillo Bowling Ball and throws him down the alley, but Armadillo Bowling Ball takes his stand here. He purposely bounces off course and flies right at Rock Stone, knocking him in the belly. Fred and Mr. Slate's team lose, the ladies team has won, Mr. Slate is disappointed, and Fred is confused about how he threw so terribly here. We jump to the Great Gazoo. He continues writing. He has been called back to his home planet, Las Vega, to issue his final report. He says if the human species does survive, it won't be because of their political leadership. It will have to be something deeper. The species will have to grow up. There's simply no other way. Fred, after his bowling match, places his bowling ball in his garage and he tells Barney I may never bowl again. Barney comforts Fred by saying, It's okay, my garage is a museum of failed hobbies. Armadillo Bowling Ball, now living in this garage, hears a voice saying, Can you let me out? I'm scared of the dark. Bowling Ball opens a drawer, and in it is a different, new pink elephant vacuum cleaner. And it's been living in this garage in this drawer. Bowling Ball lets the elephant out of its drawer, and gets to talking to him about life. And Bowling Ball says, The key is not to think about work when you're not working. That's when they own you. The second humans leave, your mind is your own. Let it wander as far from them as possible. And having a comfortable place to sleep also helps. This new elephant vacuum cleaner is happy for the advice and says, Nobody tells him anything in the drawer. Bowling Ball helps Elephant make his drawer more comfortable and says, There, that's better. If you get scared or need help with anything, just give me a call and I'll be there. That's what a friend does. And the elephant vacuum cleaner asks, How did you get to know so much? And Bowling Ball answers, Somebody taught me. As he looks out the window and remembers his long lost friend who passed away. We see Reverend Tom is talking to this other priest. And they ask, Which donuts bring us closer to Gerald? Glazed or bear claws? 
Pebbles knocks and interrupts. Reverend Tom says, oh, hi, Pebbles. We were just discussing a theological question. What can I do for you? And Pebbles asks that in her young scientist group, she is taught to test our beliefs and base them on evidence. And she asks, how do you know that this Gerald is real? And the priest responds, uh, I don't. The truth is we are all born incomplete into a universe not of our making. And we all need something to fill that void to make us feel like we exist for a reason. For some people, that's family. For others, it's art. But some of us need Gerald to fill that void, to make our lives feel as though they've mattered. It's okay if you don't need that. Science is probably better at telling you what to believe, but religion is more about what you need to believe. In the end, I don't think it really matters whether Gerald is real or not, so long as our need for him is real. After Pebbles leaves, Reverend Tom goes outside and he sees the other priest is writing something on the sign outside the church, but it doesn't fit. So the Reverend says, we'll just abbreviate it. And the sign now says, instead of Gerald reads, GD doesn't rub it in, GD rubs it out. Next day at the quarry, Mr. Slate calls Fred into his office. He is still steamed about losing in bowling. Kathy sent Mr. Slate a photo of her celebrating her win, but Mr. Slate decides to offer Fred the foreman promotion anyway. He tells Fred, look, I'm running a quarry here. Lives depend on every choice I make. I realize that now and I can't leave those decisions up to bowling. So you want the job or not? Fred enthusiastically accepts. He finally got the job he always wanted. We go back to the Great Gazoo, he is signing off his final report, and he writes, At my recommendation, they have placed a decoy station in orbit around Earth. We see this huge, creepy-looking alien head projection. It should keep any alien invaders away for now. Gazoo says, This should keep the Earthlings safe for a few millennia, and hopefully give the human race enough time to either get its act together or gracefully go extinct. Despite their shortcomings, they show great capacity for change. Now we see Mr. Slate washing and caring for his turtle, Philip. Gazoo continues, and even their stupidity is charming. We see Barney eating some meaty thumbs, the pet food. And Barney says, wait, this isn't cereal. Gazoo continues, final report. As for whether or not the species will survive to maturity, I give them about even odds. Where they go from here is anybody's guess, and it's entirely up to them. And then he leaves the planet, and the entirety of Bedrock is there to say goodbye to Kazoo, I suppose, as well as to us, the reader, on this adventure. And that is how the series ends. Alright, so that was The Flintstones. Uh, thank you all who made it through two hours of this uh, video. But I hope you all now see what I saw in this book and the funny parts of it, whether it be Claude the Destroyer being ridiculous or Ralph the Bully punching people in the beef. But um, yeah, lots of funny stuff in this book and lots of biting social commentary, which I found really interesting. And I hope you all did as well. I thought this book did such a good job taking such an old property like the Flintstones and updating it for modern audiences and really staying true to the original characters but changing them a bit as well. And um, yeah, this book is just fantastic. If I had to give a criticism, maybe not every single commentary is perfect and not every joke lands, but um, for the most part, it's a very enjoyable ride and a very smart, intelligent ride. Every issue, you're getting some interesting commentary on something. So yeah, this was a great series. I'm gonna give this one a nine out of 10. Uh, thank you all for watching. And we'll be back next week with the first volume of Why the Last Man.